So the image on the right is very good for sending to the press. Press these days, they don't have the time or the budget to do much of their own photography. They might do one uh, commission shoot a month, but most of the sort of, if there's a section where they're showing, you know, things that have come out recently that you can buy or gift guide or a feature on something or other, they're gonna want to use um, brands lifestyle photography. So if you give them a lifestyle photo and some cutouts, that will give them everything they need and they'll be much more likely to feature you. Make it easy for them. Don't have them asking you for shots that you can't deliver in time, just have it all ready. When it comes to doing your own photography versus working with a professional, um, mostly I would say your own photography is particularly good for daily behind the scenes. So showing what's happening in your studio, how you go about your life, you know, your, your sort of inspirations. If you're making one-off bespoke work, um, the process that goes into making something, um, whether it's ceramics uh, with the, the glazing and, and the kiln firing or textiles, the sort of weaving and the, the finishing or glass or printmaking, all of that is really fascinating. That's a massive advantage that independent brands have is that you can just literally use your phone to document those stages. Now you wouldn't necessarily show the process images um, on your online shop. You might use your blog. You might have some in a gallery, definitely for social media, for your newsletter. Um, if there's an appropriate image that shows perhaps the range of work shot in a kind of maker space or where you're actually making it, that might be nice for the online shop for like a third or fourth image perhaps, but usually it's for social media and, and blogging, that kind of thing. If you're working with a professional once to twice a year, you would do a day shoot. And the focus there would be on the hero press images, the website banner that's gonna stay up for, you know, four to six months on your website, product category images. So it's very much less is more. You're maybe getting 10 to 20 really great shots out of it, which you can use throughout the whole year. And as you get better at doing your own photography, you can try and do these, these shots yourself. You just have to allocate the right amount of time and be patient and execute a very good plan so that you're not wasting your time when you're shooting. But, you know, obviously the more evolved the shots are with styling, you might want to work with a stylist or an assistant or a photographer to achieve that level of, of quality. But you'll be learning the whole time, so you'll get better and better yourself. So an example um, with Sue Pryke, one of my clients I've been working with for about eight years now. We do her product shots on a piece of linen against a gray wall at her house. And more recently, I've recreated these in my studio because um, of COVID, so less traveling, but usually I'd go up there and would shoot with natural light. So this is just in her kitchen, there's a skylight and a kind of patio door to the right of the frame. And there's a very nice soft natural light coming across from right to left, nice shadow, looks very natural. The gradient on the product, so it goes light to dark, creates a nice shadow, which makes it look nice and three-dimensional. You don't want these shots to be too flat and you don't want two shadows. Two shadows are definite no-nos. You don't want a window on both sides with double light coming in. That might seem better because you're getting more light, but then you have this strange thing with two shadows and it looks a bit sort of disjointed. So if you have two windows like this, or if you have a number of windows, consider blocking some of them off and think about where you want the light to come from. And you can use uh, white foam board or even a white piece of paper just out of the frame on the other side to soften the shadow. Later on, I'll show you a photo of my studio where you can see that in action. Foam board I'm talking about looks like this. You can get different sizes. It's literally the most um, flexible and effective piece of material you can get to, to do your own um, light controls in the studio. It's really fantastic. You can also use black foam board to do the opposite, to add shadow or block light. Sue's also 
very good and honest on her Instagram feed. It's worth looking at. So she'll share <clears throat> photos of her house, garden, studio, when she's walking around, nature, seasonal things. Um, if she's been featured in the press, she'll show the process, uh, her tools, the firing and the kiln, all of those things. So it's a very diverse and lively Instagram feed. And she doesn't share, probably one in 10 is like a product shot. The rest of the images are behind the scenes, DIY, um, you know, more loose, more free. Studio Flock is another example, but much more contemporary graphic geometric textiles. So Jenny, who runs Studio Flock, she'll do one to two shoots a year in the studio or on location. In this case, it was a collaboration with Urkel where they upholstered some of their chairs. So it's very much color blocking, fun, dynamic, that sort of thing. Um, and then on her Instagram, she will share product photos, introducing the new ranges of fabric that they're bringing out, but also colorful geometric graphic architecture and pattern. It's very focused. It's a very niche um, feed. So it's worth looking at. It's very clear with Sue's, with Studio Flocks, also with Joe Ham and brands like that, you know immediately what you're looking at on their Instagram. It's consistent, it has a visual language that's easy to understand. And I know it's tempting to share lots of photos of random things and I do it myself sometimes, but if you want people to buy from you and trust you, that consistency is very important. So when you're doing your own photos and you're going for like a lifestyle context, one way to look at it is a kind of studio set build where you're controlling the lighting and you're building everything in a space. So as opposed to shooting in a room or at a location property, you're using a paper background or a painted board to create a color behind and then you're placing objects like plinths, furniture, shelving in front of that color and then staging things at different sizes and levels to give a sense of uh, of feeling um the image on the left was shot for um oxo tower so it's a range of different products and that was used on a billboard so we left space on the top right there um many of the images that we've shot for handmade in britain have a similar feel where we leave space in the image um, to allow for text overlay afterwards. The image on the right, painted background, pre-drilled uh, board, because we're hanging that quite heavy thing. It's a letter, letter board, it's made of metal, so it needs to be pre-drilled. Um, if you do have wall hung work, consider pre-drilling, pre-painting boards before the shoot. Don't expect you can turn up somewhere and just hang it on the wall. You might not be allowed to drill. The wall might not take the weight. It might not, the, the hanging point might not be in the right place. So if you do it in the studio yourself, if you build this kind of set, um, you can control the positioning and the lighting to much more of a degree. Creating a mood with a lifestyle is, is another way you can look at it. So these are two things shot in our studio. On the left is natural light. So it's very close to the window has that kind of Dutch Rembrandt style lighting where the light's coming from above and to the left of the object. That's a classic way of lighting that you see in paintings, portrait paintings particularly. It's a visual language that we understand kind of subconsciously because we've been exposed to it so much. Um, so it doesn't mean the light can't come from the right, that's fine too, but left or right, directional is part of what creates this mood and which we, we respond to, we think, oh, that's romantic, that's calming, that's inviting, that's natural. Whereas when the lighting is directly from the front, it tends to result in unpleasant reflections. You can't really see the shadows, or if you can, they go behind the object. You end up with very flat lighting, so the image looks flat. And remember that photos on a screen or in the hand in a book, it's a flat two dimensional surface. So you have to achieve the, 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 um, the three-dimensional feel 
by controlling the lighting and positioning yourself in a way that you get a fall off of light across the object. It's very important. So when you're observing where you can shoot, walk around your house, walk around your studio. Um, if you go to someone else's house or family's place, look around, be constantly taking images on your phone and thinking that's a really nice spot by the window there on that ledge or in the attic. Or often I find hallways are really good if you can get back far enough, because if you open your front door, there can sometimes be a very nice light coming from that. Um, you know, you know I've, done, I've done shoots in basements, in garden sheds, in um, farmhouses where there's, it's almost pitch black, but there's just a tiny window. Sometimes all you need is a very small defined point of light. and You just find that spot where there's a nice bit of texture and something. So observe lighting, walk around, make notes. It also changes during different times of the day. A particular spot might be completely dark in the morning, but then by the afternoon, it's lovely and vice versa. So make some notes. Think about these different places you can shoot in at different times of the day and prepare as much as you can so you can take advantage of that light. On the right is a much more dynamic stylized image where we have a, a wooden disc that was pre-painted and, and uh, textured to look like a kind of rusty sheet. Um, and then we have these two uh, lights which are turned on and it almost looks like the lights are lighting the scene, but the lights actually coming from my flashlights to the left. So it's kind of more of a hard contrasty light. And then off behind the disc on the floor is black cloth and black paper. So there's, it almost goes to pure black over there. So there's the eye is drawn due to the lighting and the composition, the eye is drawn to the product very clearly. So the more you can control the light, the more you can do things like that. So here we are on location. Um, this is in Broadstairs in Kent in an Edwardian house, which the owner has filled with lovely mid-century furniture. So it's got lots of period details and nice props that we can use. And we were able to spend a few days there and work with some different clients to, um, to create some nice lifestyle photography using the, the features of the house, such as the staircase and the alcoves and the flooring to, and the plants. It was very easy to shoot there because it's a spacious property and it's got these nice features. We could do a bit of prep and planning and then turn up and make the most of the time. If you're hiring a house, it might cost you anything from 800 to 1500 a day. So you have to be careful um, to give yourself enough time um, to take advantage of the location. So planning is very important, understanding the light at different times of the day and having a very clear shot list so you can go in there and really bring these things to life. So if you look at a product shot of that chair or the proof or the print, the product shot is very informational based. It's like, that's the object, that's the print. The wood looks like that, the fabric looks like that. And then taking it into a lifestyle context, you get relative scale. You understand how big the chair is. You get a sense of where you might use that chair or the cushion or where you might hang the textile piece, um, how the things look together. Quite often your clients will, or your customers will um, buy a number of things from you. They might buy the chair and the proof and the print. And they might, not, they might not display them together in the house like this, but it's good to show them together. It gives a feeling of the brand connecting and how the different types of product you're selling relate to each other. Uh, someone's asking about lampshades. Um, yeah, it depends on, uh, I was shooting some lampshades yesterday for Kitty actually, Kitty McCall who's featured here. Um, you can either shoot the lampshade not hanging or on a base, just sitting on a surface. That's quite good for a product shot. If you just want to create a cutout, you just have to light it fairly evenly, or you can shoot it hanging from a flex, which is more difficult because the flex often isn't straight and the lampshade won't be straight. Or you can shoot it on a lamp base, which is slightly easier to, to tweak and get the thing straight. And perhaps the base you're selling is part of the product or you're doing a collaboration with someone who um, makes the lamp base for you or something. 
but yeah, hanging on a flex is probably the hardest way to shoot a lampshade. Um, I would more likely shoot them directly side on on some white paper and then add the flex in Photoshop or get an editor to add it nice and straight so they're all consistent if you think you want a flex. Um, usually a lampshade will hang um, on a flex and perhaps if it's on the base, it might be inverted. So it depends on the, which way you're, the print is going or the design is going. Um, if the lampshade looks good when it has light, when it has a bulb on, by all means, shoot it on and off. Um, one of my clients, Tabatha Barg, does cardboard 3D printed kind of lampshades and they look incredible when the light's on and when it's off, but very, very different. Whereas a standard fabric lampshade might look pretty similar. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have it on and off, but ideally, sure, then people understand how it looks. Of course, then you have to maybe advise on which bulb to use, like a very bright bulb will look different to an LED bulb or a dimming bulb, so or filament bulb. So keep that in mind. Um, you don't want to mislead people as to how it will look. But yeah, if you can shoot it on and off, absolutely. Um, somebody's asking about jewelry. I will come to that in a minute because I've got some jewelry examples. Um, with furniture on location, sometimes, you know, this was shot at a, a location property in London in the basement. And we thought it was too dark down there. And then suddenly in the afternoon, the light got really nice. So we quickly set up this scene. It has this nice kind of Nordic, um, cool, festive, seasonal vibe um, with the logs and the sort of uh, natural materials and the angled light. Again, it's very sort of painterly and it accentuates the, um, the bench nicely. So if you can take advantage of that light on location, by all means do that because it's, um, it's definitely, uh, you're going to have a, a limit of the amount of time in there and you're going to want to take advantage of that light when it comes. Again, furniture, but a very different kind of furniture, more kind of slick and minimal. And therefore the property we used is more minimal. It's kind of a 60s house in Dulwich. Just had some nice features, nice space, nice even bright light. And we could take the furniture in different places and just shoot it simply because it shows scale. It shows where you might put it in the house. Um, and the propping and the styling is quite minimal. There's just a few stationary items on there to show the scale. If you're working with food and drink, then by all means, uh, you know, go for it, but don't do fully plated cooked food unless you really know what you're doing. And perhaps you're doing a full like party scene or something. It's best to stick to sort of simple things like bread and butter and jam, tapas type food, fruit, um, maybe muesli or something, but don't go too crazy. You're just going to give yourself a headache. Um, food is very hard to work with when it's cooked. It won't look good for very long. And you're going to need someone like a chef or a home economist to help you with that. Uh, drinks can be fine if you're doing glassware or um, obviously tea and coffee. Um, sort of is a big thing now. People are drinking a lot more diverse and, and high quality tea and coffee. So if you can work with a stylist or think about how you might use your ceramics or your glassware to serve those things and create a, a nice scene, by all means do that. Prop making is another way you can approach it. Um, this is a more fun sort of stylized theatrical way. To um, two different stylists here, Claire Nicholson on the left and Annabelle Lamb on the right. Um, on the left, um, this was very much like a pre-planned, pre-painted color palette for each shot. So we had about eight of these shots. Each one was executed in a way where all the props were ready to go on that color. And we had certain color papers and certain types of um, wooden discs, which were painted. You can get things like wooden discs and plinths and shapes quite affordably now and paint them yourself. Um, and you can get you know household objects like these and spray paint them quite easily yourself as well. So it's a cool way to introduce color, to take familiar objects, but to reinterpret them, to bring a bit of fun and humor. If it suits your product, like it very much suited these cuddly toys from Noodle, because that's their whole brand aesthetic. Whereas if you're making quite serious kind of elegant ceramics for the art market, it probably wouldn't suit it. So think about 
the context of your your product in the scene and whether prop making and custom backgrounds are relevant for you or not on the right it's more of a kind of graphic stationary thing going on with um some pre-painted texturized cones layering with different types of paper um, but again the print um, in this case by joe ham is very much the hero so custom backgrounds are particularly useful for smaller objects because you don't need to have more than say 30 to 40 centimeters um, so in this case with the jewelry you can have a, a board maybe 30 to 40 centimeters and a disc that's maybe 20 centimeters diameter and a little block maybe eight or nine centimeters long you can paint them in different colors texturize them and then you have this nice layered um, scene where you can introduce a necklace a ring earrings and a few props to give it a sense of uh, a sense of sort of style and fun um, so jewelry doesn't have to be on a model i think if you are working with jewelry it's good to have shots on a model if you can because it really shows scale how it looks against the skin how it hangs on the body that sort of thing but if you're doing lifestyle photography without a model this sort of thing flat lay small in area you can do quite a lot and um, definitely good to have blocks plinths stones um, different surfaces to play with just to see what works for your for your jewelry you know silver gold gemstones will look very different on different surfaces and different colors and again this uh shot i think was for ual st martin's or the university of the arts shop so there's a few different makers involved and um it's kind of a fun useful look with the color blocking whereas if you if you've got a slightly more serious um high-end thing you might want marble concrete um something like copper or brass something to look a bit slicker again custom backgrounds pre-painted you can look on youtube for tutorials about how to make these essentially they're it's a wooden board that's then painted in certain colors and, and texturized with a sponge or sandpaper and then layered with several coats of paint and sealed with a clear uh, varnish like a decorator's varnish and then you can have a few of these boards around in your studio they just they can lean against the wall they don't take up a lot of space and you can use them again and again for your shots and change them every once in a while uh, we have a lot of um, maybe 50 or 60 different surfaces in the studio that we can pull out and combine so you can use them flat like the cushions where the camera is quite high and it's looking down on the on the floor or side on where you have one board as a base and the other board as a background with a horizon line. So that's a nice way to do a consistent product shot set up for ceramics, lampshades in this case. Um, this is another nice way to shoot lampshades if you have a group of them just to sort of collage a few of them together. It gives a nice feel and it shows the different sizes and the, the different prints you can offer. It's much easier to do this than to try and hang multiple lampshades on flexes it never looks very good. It can take a long time to get right. So just keep it simple. Do something like that against a nice background and you'll, you'll get a nice fun image to play with. Again, look out for nice tables, vintage or reclaimed wood. Sometimes people throw away things on the street that are really nice. Or you just might need a bit of a clean or a sand or or you can get some nice floorboards and just arrange them and put a bracket underneath to make a small table. It's really all you need to um, create a nice scene. So again, this is more of a studio thing or it's not what I call full lifestyle, but it's creating uh, maybe a group shot of your products. In this case, Tip Studio and um, uh, another ceramicist whose name escapes me, um, showing a range of products in this case, there's some plants in the ceramics. Not every ceramicist likes putting plants in their, in their work, but many people buy ceramics to put succulents and cacti in. So, you know, obviously you can decide if you want to do that or not, but if your audience is doing that with your work, it's probably best to embrace that and uh, take some photos yourself. 
when it comes to using the images on a website, um, it's very good to think about how the image is going to be used and the context it's going to go in and the overlays and the buttons that are going to appear there. So if you're doing a website banner, like a longer, thinner kind of letterbox format, think about where the logo and the, the site navigation is going to go. So this was done for the DNA shop. Um, it's kind of a Christmas seasonal image showing a range of things, decorations, cards, um, but leaving some negative space to the left and the background is dark enough to allow the overlay to be seen. So the end result is this, where the navigation, the buttons, the logo and everything, the call to action button, the thing you click on to buy something, everything's visible and legible. Um, what I often see on people's websites is an image that's too busy behind or there's no negative space, there's no contrast. So it's hard to read what's happening. Also think about how it looks on a phone. 40 to 60% of your website visitors are gonna be on a mobile. So you can spend all this time doing nice website banners, but if only half the people are gonna see the image like that, the rest of them are gonna see a much more compressed version of it, square or portrait format. Usually it's gonna crop into the center of your image. So make sure you test how that looks on a phone and think about what you want to prioritize in terms of your audience. You know, you might have more than, if you're doing fashion, fashion accessories, your audience might be 70 to 80% mobile. They might be shopping on Instagram and clicking on an image, going to the site on the phone and buying something on the phone straight away and paying on the phone. It's becoming a lot easier to do that in the last year, especially to pay with Apple Pay, to pay with PayPal or a saved credit card on your phone. So make it easy for people to do that. Any barriers you put in the way of them buying, the less likely they are gonna buy from you. So make it easy. Using your images on social media, um, there's many ways you can do that. Of course, different platforms have different um, specifications and formats. Instagram is mostly square or for the feed, but in terms of Instagram stories, it's vertical. Um, vertical portrait. It's kind of like a movie crop 69, but turned on its on its side. So for the feed, you might, if you've just done a shoot, you might have an image like this, which is a detail shot, which shows um, texture, the embroidery, the weaving, uh, the thread, the logo, stitching, that kind of thing, to introduce kind of a preview of what's happening. And then later on, you would show the full image with the same product in context and the full design. So it's nice to introduce things to tease things slowly. I'm also a big fan of using detail shots as the banner on a homepage because I think it really brings you into the work and then you click on something and you see the whole thing after that. So you don't have to give the whole thing away straight away. Create a sense of um, intrigue, allow someone to explore, to click on something. Um, rather than just uh, you know, show the whole thing straight away and they might lose interest. This image here was, it's a recent shoot we did in Dorset from a Jada Clark, who's at Cockpit Arts. She's a weaver. Um, this is a good example of using natural light that was fleeting. So there was only about five minutes when the light was like this. And this is the image that ended up being her kind of hero shot for the shoot, because it was just, as you can see, the light's just hitting the wood on the back and creates a nice shadow and there's a warmth to it. There's there's something happening in the image, some magic going on. So yes, you can recreate this with flash lighting in the studio if you really know what you're doing, but if you can do it on location and, and embrace the natural light, and take advantage of that, then that's much better. Uh, with Pinterest, um, it's good to think about not wasting your time on there by just clicking on things for ages, which can happen. It's a bit of a rabbit hole of, of imagery. Um, but what you'll find is brands that have a good brand language will have nice boards, which are consistent and showcase the things that they're into. So you'll have your own product shots or your own lifestyle images mixed with other shots you've found on Pinterest, whether that's um, a seasonal thing, uh, other ceramicists or makers that you like, Sue's got a nice thing for indigo and grays, and then she's got 
uh, a board which is all about her stockists. So the shops that sell her work and what they're doing with their own photography. Um, and also the process, uh, making process, that sort of thing. So Pinterest is a very effective marketing tool, but it's also a big time suck if you get drawn into it, suddenly you've spent an hour not really achieving anything. So, you know, allow yourself some time to, to browse and it's very good for mood boarding for a shoot as well. So many of my clients will use Pinterest to gather images that they like. Just make sure you have a real focus. Don't just pull out nice photos, pull out photos that you think you can achieve within the time and the budget and your skill set, and also ones that really resonate with your brand that actually um, make sense and aren't just nice pictures. Joe Ham as well is very good on Pinterest. Um, Joe has a very, very clear understanding of branding. She comes from a marketing communications background. So she knows all about having a visual identity that's consistent that you really understand from her product range, who it is, logo even, you just see the silhouette of the rabbits and you know it's ham. And again, her Pinterest board is very curated along the lines of um, different things she's into. Some of them are quite niche, like she has a, a rabbit of the month competition, which is a real fun favorite because everyone likes pictures of cute rabbits. Um, and so that works really well as a kind of fun thing that people share and get into and of course it connects to her brand because many of her products feature the rabbits then she has you know photo shoots that she's done garden living room office but again it's very easy to browse pinterest and just start pinning loads of things just have a real focus with it if you're going to have a, a board about bathrooms that you like really think about the bathroom that you like think about the bathroom that your products might go into um, and keep editing the board, going back to it, take a few things off, put new things on there. Um, think about someone looking through that. You want them to be still thinking about your brand while they're looking at those photos. And, you know, Pinterest can be a whole world unto itself. Your images can get shared hundreds of times in different places and might lead to a sale indirectly. So make sure you've got good captions and titles for the pictures that you upload there as well. So you can upload your own photos to your boards and use captions and tags. And in some cases you can add links and shop links as well if you connect to Pinterest business. So make sure you do that. The same goes for Instagram. You have to do that through Facebook. But if you connect Facebook, Instagram and your website catalog on Shopify or Squarespace, you can pin your products and make them clickable to the shop on Instagram itself. Competitions and giveaways are really useful. So if you are um, able to collaborate with another brand and then do a kind of co-promotion where your followers can, um, can win something by liking or um, commenting and, and sharing the post, then that's a really good way to get more awareness and more promotion for what you're doing. You have to plan these things out in your photo shoots. You have to allow some time. You think, okay, I'm gonna this half an hour, we're gonna do the photos for that competition. I've got the things ready, just something simple where you can see what you're gonna win. Something doesn't have to be full lifestyle. It's more like just a layout shot where you can see the objects. Thornback and Peel are good at doing this. So they they very much do homeware, kitchen and dining stuff. So for them to do a co-promotion with a tea company, really makes sense. So if you are gonna do a co-promotion, make sure it's a, a relevant brand for what you're doing so that you both benefit from it. it should be a, a mutually beneficial relationship. So if you're gonna approach another brand, make sure that they are actually appropriate, appropriate for what you're doing, not just a brand that you like. So there were a few questions before I'll leave the slide up. Um, Leslie was asking, what's the best way to shoot a luxury handbag product? Um, okay, so for that, I would say, I'm just gonna put in the chat, one of my clients called Grace Gordon, handbags and accessories, good reference. So Google her. Um, we've done lots of shoots in the studio and with models. 
um, which are a very good example of just clean, minimal um, luxury handbag and accessories photos. Um, for example, if you have a handbag that's sitting on a bit of white paper and you want to do a simple product shot using some fishing wire to hold up the handles, which you can edit out afterwards, is sometimes a good trick because the handles often will flop around and they won't stay straight. Obviously, if it's a model, they can hold it on their shoulder, in their hand, by their leg. Um, maybe it's a rucksack, whatever it is. Again, a model is very good to show scale, context. Um, perhaps you can do some video of them walking with it. So worth a look. Um, Deborah was asking the straight lines of the surroundings often don't stay looking vertical. Yeah, so I'll, I'll come to that in a minute when it comes to um, straight lines and um, tangents and things lining up. It's very good to have a grid view on your camera. So I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, so you can see that. Um, Elise is also asking, what do you think about images with a model blurring the model and accentuating the earring using Photoshop? Um, I would say, I mean, with an earring, yeah, I, when it comes to focus, you just have to make sure that the, the focus is not so subtle that you can't see the whole product in focus. You don't want the back of the earring to be blurred and the, 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 the front of it sharp. It's often a, a challenge when you're shooting macro with a macro lens, which is usually something like this. This is a 90 millimeter macro lens, um, which is fantastic for doing close up detail shots of jewelry and small objects. But the closer you go to the object with this kind of lens, the more fine the focus is going to be. So if I'm shooting this crystal this close, you know, only one of these panels of the crystal is going to be sharp and the rest of it's going to be soft, which for the eye, when you look at it, is a bit hard to take in. So in that case, it's good to, to move the camera back a bit, allow a bit more of it to be in focus and then crop in later so that it's a bit easier to understand what you're looking at. So I wouldn't, I'd be careful with making sort of things blurry on a model. Um, yeah, and it's particularly with jewelry, it's a quite hard balance to achieve how much is in focus um, compared to um, what's out of focus. With think, ceramics, larger objects, it's good to use that effect if it's hanging in a room or on a table. So you, you understand the context of the room, but the focus is on the object in front of you. So if you're doing your own photos at home, here's some essential kit that you can get. Again, this PDF will be sent around to you, so don't worry about writing all this down. I'll just give you a summary. Um, I think the number one bit of kit is a foam board, like I mentioned earlier. So a piece of foam board like this is really, really effective at bouncing light back into a scene. So if I have an object here and I have the foam board close to it or far away, it will make the shadow less extreme on one side. Near a window, um, you don't want to have to spend half an hour, 45 minutes getting things out of covers to shoot because then you'll miss the opportunity. Some sort of diffusion material like tracing paper um, or muslin. I'll just show you. Um, this is what I use often in the studio. This is actually a big roll of diffusion. It's also called translum or um, diffusion roll. This is made by a company called Lee, L-E-E -E filters. You can actually get this on a roll, hang it on a light stand or off something. You can cover a whole window with this. It's very effective. Um, you can buy this kind of thing from, which I'll just put in the chat, suppliers, wax, photo, Center in London and Cass Arts. They all have different types of it. Pro Center has the really pro stuff like this, which costs about 45 pounds for a roll. Um, Wex has 
the biggest range and Cass Arts has more art supplies, but they have tracing paper and smaller things which you can use for um, uh, jewelry and uh, small objects. So clamps, A clamps like this are absolutely essential for securing things. And a tripod for your camera is absolutely essential because you want the camera set up on the tripod. Let's get my tripod. It's worth spending a couple of hundred pounds on a tripod. Don't cheap out and get a cheap one because your little camera will end up falling off and breaking and that's no good for anybody. You want it to be solid. And actually for me, it's a two part thing. You have a tripod and you have what's called the tripod head. So the tripod is actually the legs. The tripod head is this bit. So the legs, one part, head the other bit. You might buy them together, you might buy them separately. But this bit is just as important. So this screws on with a large, with tripods you have two size screws. You have a, a large thread screw and you have a small one basically. And the small one usually goes into the camera um, itself and the large one secures this sort of thing. Make sure that's tight. And then you have what's called a, a locking plate or a base plate on the camera, which connects to this bit of the tripod. Just securely goes on there. And then you can move the camera around on different axes. In this case, it's called a three-way head. So you have spinny up and down there and side to side if you want to go portrait. So that's called a three-way head. This is a three-way geared head, which is particularly good for jewelry because I can move it like this or I can slowly twist these knobs to make micro adjustments to get things straight. And there's a spirit level in three different places on the tripod to make sure things are straight. So once the camera's on a tripod, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You can then arrange your products, use clamps, use bits of foam board, use your diffusion material to set your scene and it frees up your hands. And do if you're changing one thing at a time, you can just take your time. If you're holding the camera yourself with one hand, you've only got one hand left to do everything else. So that's absolutely not a good plan. Um, a couple of light stands are useful as well. I'll just get, a light stand here a second. This is actually a good one from Camulet or Wex actually bought Camulet, so Wex Frederick. So you have a standard light stand, be like a bit like a tripod where you'll open up the legs and lock the legs. And then the central column will be adjustable in two or three places. And then in this case, I've got this useful attachment on top, which goes on to standard light stand, light stand attachment, one screw there. And I can use this arm to extend and hang things off, hold things, um, has a variety of uses. So very useful. And there's various different brands that make these. This one's a fairly cheap one actually, but it's lasted pretty well. I've got another one over there that's much more heavy duty, that's metal. Um, it's made by a company called, um, is that Lee or Matthews, Matthews. So look out for Matthews if you want to spend some money on some real heavy steel, heavy duty stuff, otherwise Wex and do these sort of things a bit cheaper. It depends what you're holding really. Um, blue tack, masking tape, glue dots, gaffer tape can all be useful. Um, a soft pencil for marking, um, on a piece of paper where your product's gonna go if you're shooting 20 cups in a row and you're taking one away and shooting the other one, just make an outline behind the cup with a pencil on the paper so that you can place it in the same place and have your camera in the same place on a tripod. Someone's asking, can you recommend a good Photoshop app for beginner taking photos on iPhone or iPad? Um, yeah, actually I would look at I mean, there's, there's free apps that you can, I'll mention in a second, um, but one of the best paid ones is called Affinity Photo. And they have an award-winning app 
for the iPad, but also a desktop app. Um, they're pretty much the main competitor to Adobe. So Adobe, you have to subscribe to the Adobe Cloud to get um, Photoshop, InDesign, After Effects, these different apps. Affinity, you can buy the app as a standalone product and you don't have to um, subscribe. So that's why I made the switch. Also, I don't use Adobe Illustrator and InDesign and these different applications. I just need to edit photos and I use, so I use Affinity. Um, I, I, I use the desktop app for the Mac. Um, and there's also one called Capture One Pro, which is um, for shooting tethered, which I'll come to in a minute. I'm not going to give you a whole demonstration on shooting tethered today, but I am going to do some workshops at my new studio specifically for shooting tethered in the future. I'll probably have one every two months. So if you're getting serious about that, then by all means, book in on one of those workshops. Uh, plinths, blocks, shelves, things like that, very useful. Um, and again, some suppliers. Great Art in Shoreditch are the best place to get the plinths. Um, they're called Gert Stacker plinths um, of different sizes, like this one here. This is a bigger one. This is, I think, 80 centimeters by 30. They can be pitted. So they just, they just come in a kind of natural color. Um, We've got a whole load of them. Here's another one, smaller one, square one that we've painted. And we repaint these every every month for different shoots. Really useful for creating different heights uh, for your photos. So here's um, an example of how I shoot in the studio using the foam boards and diffusion paper and different clamps and stands to hold things and also the background paper that's sort of creating what we call an infinity curve, a seamless background. So it's one sheet of paper that's held on a stand behind, it folds down and it's clamped on the table. So this curve creates the illusion of there being no background. That's the most effective way to photograph things if you don't want there to be an horizon line or if you're doing a cutout. Um, usually you'd use a paper roll for this. Again, you can buy these at Wex or, or Cass Arts. Um, and if you're shooting smaller things like jewelry, you might only need a piece of paper that's like, you know, A3, A4, just fold it against the wall and blue tacked or clamped down. Uh, the, the, someone's asking about the plinths, Gert Stacker. Uh, the, the plinths are from Great Art in Shoreditch, but that you can go online as well. So yeah, the foam board I was talking about, what I've done here, and the image on the right, it's two of these boards. So this is um, a, a one, two A1 boards folded and taped together in the middle with, with gaffer tape so that you can create an A board that stands by itself. It's a really handy way. Again, if you're shooting by yourself, you don't need to hold things. You can just sit there on the surface. And the middle shot, you see a black bit of foam board that's behind and to the side. And that creates some shadow. It stops light hitting the background. So this edge of the white um, product will be more defined against the white background. If you're shooting white things on white background, you can get this thing where the edge bleeds into the, the, um, the back, which you don't want. So someone's else asking. Yeah, I think you've got the, the plinth. Great art. There's some people asking questions in the Q&A and some people asking in the chat. So I'm trying to put them in both. So look at both Q&A and the chat for the answers, please. Um, light boxes uh, for jewelry. Yes, they're useful um, for small things. Um, light is usually an LED. So they're good for reducing um, shadows and highlights. Um, but keep in mind that um, 
they will have a limit on the size. So like a small bowl, small pieces of jewelry is okay, but something larger like a jug or a large plate, you might need to basically make your own light box using this kind of diffusion paper and foam boards and things to reduce the highlights. It's basically about managing reflections. That's what photography is. So light bounces off things and reflects back to our eyes or the camera. And that determines what we see. That determines if there's a reflection of you in the glass bowl or a reflection of the window in the reflective ceramic glaze. Everything has reflection, even textiles that look flat there was there's reflection going on in the fibers so it's about experimenting it's about trying things it's about moving things but change one thing at a time don't change five things and then take another photo because they won't understand what you have um, changed so be systematic about it so here's me shooting tethered that's what i was talking about so my laptop or my computer is connected to the camera by a cable like a usb cable and the images I take on the camera come up on the computer live straight away. You can also do what's called live view, which is particularly useful if you have two screens. So I have my laptop or my iMac and I have another screen on the wall. So the camera has a, a kind of video feed. So if I'm moving something around in front of the camera, I will see the live video feed as I'm doing it. And then I take a photo. So it's very useful for a stylist who's working with me to make adjustments without having to take 300 photos every time. So shooting tethered, again, I will be doing some workshops starting next month in London, um, really introducing how to work with the different softwares in a, and going through the technical aspects, but also kind of practically the workflow you need to do to get good photos and how to edit and save the images properly. Um, it's too much detail to go into now, but it's absolutely a way to go if you want to get more serious and consistent with your product shots. In this case, the tripod I have, it does this thing where I can extend the legs and then the central column pops out and then goes vertically. So essentially you can loosen this, this screw, move it up, pop it out of there and then Go down and have the camera go like that. You just have to be careful when you're doing this to support the camera on the opposite side with a weight or a heavy thing that doesn't fall over. Um, but it's a kind of a, a quick way to do um, flat lays to get the camera vertically up and I'm just going to take this off for a second spend half an hour around with my tripod there we go but yeah so that's called a th it's a, a three section tripod that does this vertical thing so not all tripods do that so you go to a camera shop or you look online make sure you Look for a three section truck or talk to someone at the sales center. Make sure you're getting the right tripod. Um, tripods generally fit any camera. There's some exceptions um, They don't work for phones. So if you've got a mobile phone, you're going to need something more like a camera clamp, which um, Manfrotto do. I'll put that in the chat. Camera, actually, I'll call it own clamp. There's other ones on Amazon, but Manfrotto do a good one. Manfrotto make fantastic tripods and stands. So Wex sell that one. Um, it costs like 12, 15 pounds. Clamp either side of the phone. And then you can, there's like a screw that you can then attach that to a tripod or to a light stand or to another setting. So you can basically clamp your phone vertically over something to do flat lays or to do DIY videos, or clamp it to a stand to do a time-lapse up in the corner of the room. Very, very useful and effective. Sometimes all you need is just a nice wall. So in this case, we've got a, a dressmaker's mannequin and um, 
a you know camera on a tripod and we're just shooting these scarves so we just did 20 or 30 different scarves in the space of half an hour because we spent time finding the light nice light positioning the camera and the stand against a nice wall and then we can just whiz through in this case it's kind of an indirect north facing big sliding door but it, because it's a big light source it creates a very soft light the bigger the light source the softer the light the more focused and targeted the light source the harder the light and therefore the harder the shadows so you'll find that if you're shooting in direct sunlight you've got the sun very far away very small dot very bright hard shadow when it's cloudy effectively it diffuses the light source and makes the shadow softer so that's something that you'll find if you're doing your own lighting or you're working with natural light Someone's asking if I do landscape photography. I don't, um, that's something else entirely. Um, but you'll find lots of tips online about um, landscape photography. I um, mean, in terms of taking your products into nature, that's something you can look at. I've done some shoots with ceramics hanging in trees on Hampstead Heath with furniture being in the middle of the woods with a model wearing something being uh, at the seaside. But obviously with outside, you've got weather You've got direct sunlight. You've got lots of challenges with, with time and access. So be careful with that. Make sure you've got a plan B. Amanda's asking any reasonably priced lamps. I'm, I'm assuming you mean like studio photography lights. Um, you could look up a brand called Len Carter. That's who I used. Um, and then if you want to spend a bit more you can go with Pro Photo, but yeah, they're a lot more expensive, but better quality or Bowens. Um, yeah, you get what you pay for with, with that kind of thing, really. Um, I, I had Lencarta lights for the first two or three years that I was working and then they worked pretty well. But then I upgraded to Pro Photo and I really noticed a difference because I've used them a lot. Um, generally, I would look at LED lights as well. Um, now everything's kind of moving towards LED as opposed to continuous kind of tungsten light or um, bulbs. Um, the LED lights have like thousands of smaller bulbs, so they create a much softer light. Usually they're not as powerful, but they're getting more powerful now. So it's worth having a look at some of those brands too. Here's an example in this photo of the trellis legs I was talking about. These are great because they're heavy duty, they're very strong. They fold down completely flat or the legs fold into this bit so I can store them very easily and then I can get them out and just put different surfaces and backgrounds on top of them. Um, very effective for doing this kind of photography. So the camera here, again, it's connected to the computer. You can see a live view in this case. Video, the same principle. And the camera's looking at this area here, and it's actually only it's only seeing this bit in the middle. So what's happening here, what's happening to the left and the right, up and down, doesn't matter. All that's important is what the camera sees. That's what you want to be focusing on. There's some specific tips for iPhone photography. Um, if you have a uh, a phone, whether it's an Android or a um, iPhone. The same basic rules apply to how the camera takes a photo as a DSLR or a compact camera or a film camera. The three things that control exposure, and you can look more into these by Googling them and seeing some sort of examples, are ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. How light sensitive it is, how frozen the motion is, and how much is in focus. And they all relate to each other. They're kind of interrelated. So if you change one, you might need to change the other one. The best way to experiment with these is put your camera in manual mode or M. And usually on your camera, most cameras, there'll be a dial at the top that you turn and M will always be manual. The other modes might have different letters, but you can experiment with those. If you put it in manual, you can make manual changes yourself on the camera by changing the shutter speed, changing the aperture, changing the ISO. You can also, if you have Canon, Nikon, some Pentax, Sony cameras, 
and Fujifilm, you can buy an older lens like this one, which has manual focus and a manual aperture ring, which is the ring closest to the point where it connects to the camera. And you can change that yourself. And it's a nice way to do more manual control and learn about the differences that a small adjustment can make. If you have your camera in full auto mode, you're not gonna understand what's happening with the camera. And you're gonna end up with very sort of, you know, flat, boring pictures. You wanna be able to control what's happening. So experiment with those. You can on the phone, you can get an app, which I'll show you in a second, which will give you manual photography controls on the phone. Some of them will even let you shoot raw, so you get highest quality and you can change shutter speed, aperture and everything. The default camera app on the phone usually won't let you control those things. The phone will just decide for you, which you know nine times out of 10 is fine. But if you want to go really nerdy and have control, you can. And you can also connect additional lenses to the phone. If you have a, a case like this, this is made by a company called Moment and the lenses sort of click into this fitting here. So I can put a wide angle lens, a telephoto lens, a macro lens. It's really effective for that. Uh, someone's asking what camera do you suggest a beginner to buy? Well, there's thousands of cameras. Just look at reviews, try and go to a camera store and test out some different models. It's often about how it feels in the hand. Um, I started with a Nikon D40X and then I had a Canon 60D. Three models to most camera manufacturers are absolutely fine. So if you don't need this crazy resolution, um, just get a, a, I would recommend getting a new camera body because essentially a camera these days is a computer with a lens on it. So getting secondhand stuff can sometimes be a bit dodgy. I wouldn't buy a secondhand laptop and I wouldn't buy a secondhand camera, but I would buy always secondhand lenses because they're usually 100%. Um, as long as you buy from a refurbished sort of official place like Wex, they have a very good secondhand lens department and you'll pay between 20 and 30% less than new. So always get secondhand lenses. And again, you can get older manual lenses, especially for Canon and Nikon, and these will click onto um, the body. There'll be, you know, an older lens from the 60s for Nikon will fit on a new Nikon DSLR. Just make sure though, when you're buying it, that that is possible. There's some models, they're called bridge cameras, often that are between, you know, uh, consumer and professional, which don't allow that, that lens fitting. So just make sure they fit, but Nikon and Canon are pretty universal. And Sony have what's called an E-mount lens system. So this lens by Zeiss fits on my Sony and it's a fantastic, fantastic lens. So if you don't have the grid enabled on your phone, on the iPhone, for example, you go into settings and then you go to camera and then you click on um, show grid. And I don't know if you can see this on my settings, but down the bottom there, I think it's reversed it, but basically in there, the default, the grid is off, but you want it on, so turn on the grid and then you'll always have this nice overlay when you're composing an image, the photo won't show the grid, it's just like an overlay. And most cameras as well, when you have them on live view, so when you see the, um, I haven't got this turned on, but on the preview, yeah, on the preview screen, you'll see I've got a grid there, which just helps me get things straight. So you want the verticals to be straight, you want the horizontals to be straight. You don't want it to look like something's falling over or it's a bit of a, on a, on a ship that's sinking. Especially useful for flat lay photography, which is one of the things that iPhone is best at or phone photography is best at, because you can just put something on the floor and hold the phone like this and get a nice flat lay shot without having to put the camera on the ceiling or on a giant tripod. So it's much more effective um, uh, tool. You can also lock focus by in the camera mode by 
pressing and holding on the screen with your finger in a certain place and then the camera will lock and even if you move the camera you'll have that focus locked in and lastly you can control the exposure by pressing and holding and then moving your finger up and down on the screen while you're pressing it and that will increase the light or decrease the light if you want to do that for effect or if you don't feel like the camera is capturing the light correctly when you're using a phone keep in mind that the default lens of the phone is usually a very wide angle almost fisheye lens which is great for doing most photography out and about landscape interiors but when you go in close to something you get this ballooning distortion happening so be careful with that and some phones have two or three lenses on them so usually when you open the camera app there's an option down the bottom that says one times two times three times and if you cycle through those buttons it changes the lens it's using that's great especially on the iphone uh, there's a lens called the portrait lens which is much more effective for taking product shots or portraits of people because it's less distortion if you do a portrait of yourself with um the wide angle lens, your face will look very wide and ballooned and distorted. If you change to the portrait one, you'll get a much more pleasant and complimentary view. Here's some advanced apps that you can use for um, uh, editing. So things like Snapseed, Camera Plus, VSCO, Moment and First Light are good for taking photos and editing in the camera or on the iPad and editing only on the phone or the iPad or the tablet. Adobe Photoshop, do some apps. Affinity Pro, which I mentioned, is award-winning for the iPad. And for adding graphics, Canva is very effective and so is Over and Darkroom as well for editing is good. And there's another one for Instagram stories called Unfold. Um, someone's asking about the phone and case moment. Um, is the company the best in the States? They do very nice phone cases and lenses. So final things to watch out for verticals and horizontals and tangents keeping things vertical or horizontal and avoid things lining up with each other so if you have a an object and behind there's another object and the edges are lining up exactly that can look a bit a bit weird you want them to overlap a bit or that for there to be a, a recognizable gap so a tangent is when two verticals or two horizontals line up exactly and that can be very jarring to look at Color temperature, very important. Especially noticeable on a white background. You probably experienced that if you photograph something where it looks yellow or orange or blue or purple. It's because the color temperature, the color balance is off. Usually most cameras are quite good at doing that automatically. However, when it comes to shooting on a white background, sometimes the camera doesn't recognize what's happening. So you can override that in the camera. You just have to keep in mind that if the lighting is inconsistent, if you're using natural light, the light will change minute to minute, even second to second in terms of color temperature and intensity. So if you're using flash lighting in the studio, it's much easier to control or if you're using continuous lights like bulbs or light box, the, um, the light is much more continuous and you can make an adjustment on the camera and you can say this is the color temperature of these lights and then you'll have a hundred percent each time just keep in mind with natural light if you're shooting on a white background you're going to have to constantly monitor the changes in lighting and make adjustments accordingly too bright too dark over or underexposed if you can err on the side of overexposure not completely but brighter is always better than darker it's easier to make something a bit darker in Photoshop than vice versa. Um, even though new cameras now are getting better and better at shooting in low light, it's always better to have too much light than not enough. Backlighting usually is not a good thing, but can be effective for shooting glossy ceramics. Like this, this 
cup has quite a glossy glaze on it. If you light it directly from the side, you have a very strong highlight down the edge. If you place it in front of a window and place yourself in front of the cup, the light will wash around the object. So if the light is my screen, and I'm looking at this, I can maybe have a piece of foam board this side to bounce light back in and it will create a much softer highlight on the object rather than direct light. And less is always more. If there's too many things in the photo, take things away, simply your products the hero. <clears throat> so a little photo challenge for you, if you're up for it. Take one of your products, photograph it in five different ways over the next five days. And if you like, share the photos on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Pinterest with the hashtag one product five ways. So this is a fun way to take what you make and place it out of context. Take it outside, hang it upside down, combine it with different textures, light it in very extreme ways, get surreal with it, um, play with scale, with texture, with angle of view. Just gives you some different ideas as to how you might photograph things in the future. You know, it might end up with a very abstract image and that's fine. It just lets you have a bit of a play with what you make. And it's a good thing to do just ongoing sometimes just to, to try something different to get out of your comfort zone, to challenge yourself. So if you've got any other questions, um, someone's asking, Sarah's asking, light boxes with built-in LEDs. I don't know any brands, I'm afraid. I've not used one myself. Um, I know, Wex photographic might sell them. So look at Wex. Um, and if you just search LED light box and have a look at some reviews. Um, and if you can go into a Photoshop and uh, test out, ask for a demonstration. Um, normally, I go to this show in Birmingham called the Photography Show once a year, but that's obviously been called off with COVID. But that's usually where companies um, uh, launch or demonstrate their um, their new products. And there's always lots of light boxes there and specialist camera equipment and things. So it's a good way to to research that. Um, please do follow me on Instagram and feel free to ask questions there or or. Um, interact and if you do this photo challenge i'll be very excited to see what you come up with um, if you've got any more questions please do just check i haven't missed anything thanks Jason. i think i have noted some questions because there are a lot of questions at one point of time um, so one of the things was about jewelry because a lot of people we see who are selling on our platform and they have some issues about uh, putting it in a model. Of course, with the lockdown and everything, getting a model is also expensive. So what is the best way you can advise them taking a, a photo, uh, you know, a photo from the camera, uh, from their phone, iPhone, and um, how much should they, what close-ups? Because sometimes, you know, if you're, they're using a member of the family, they don't want to be uh, seen. So what is the best way to crop a photo where they can see the necklace or the earring, but it's not too close and it's not too far. So the product is in focus. Yeah, jewelry is a very challenging thing to photograph, um, especially on a model. Um, you know, you have to look out for the quality of someone's skin. Um, details are super important because you're going into someone's hairs and pores and ears. And these are parts of the body that can look quite quite scary when they're close up. So you have to make sure someone's hair is very neat, that they have a manicure, that their hands are moisturized, um, and that you know you don't need to show their face or their whole body at all. It's very much a, a close up. But you have to make sure that the product fills um, you know, more than 50% of the frame. Otherwise, you can't really see the object. Um, if you're too far away, especially when you're looking at something on a phone, you won't have enough detail to recognize what's going on. 
Um, I've got, there's many um, people I work with who are very good at modeling themselves. I mean, if you're confident in front of the camera and you don't mind doing that and talking about it, it's a very effective way to do that. Um, we have one friend in Australia, uh, actually my sister-in-law, she's called Make Me Giddy. Um, just write that in the chat. If you search for her on Instagram, you'll see her. She's, you know, she's very good at talking to the camera. She does um, Holly McClay jewelry, which is a bit of a growth, growth area, particularly earrings. She especially specializes in polymer clay earrings. So that's um, kind of clay you buy that you make uh, the, the stuff with and you fire it in the oven, essentially, or cook it in the oven and it comes out kind of looking a bit like ceramic. Um, there's another maker actually who's sold with Handmade in Britain who uses a similar material and her name escapes me at the moment. I have to come back to that. Rebecca um, Thickbroom. Yes, Rebecca Thickbroom, that's it. Thank you, Piers. Um, yeah, but uh, Make Me Giddy is a good example of, of using Instagram to model herself and feature people who are wearing her earrings and talk about the materials and the process and that sort of thing. Um, when it comes to more fine jewelry, gold, silver, and gemstones, um, yeah, you, you, unfortunately, the photography process is much, much more challenging. That's why there's professionals who specialize in jewelry photography to get that really high end kind of retouch look. But that might not be right for you. Um, there's somewhere in between where you can get things nicely in focus and well lit without looking too like, you know, Tiffany and Co. Um, or Hermes. You just have to go slightly you know not diy but not like super slick somewhere in between um so look at other brands look how they are shooting their objects you know find brands who are successful online and how are they using the model how are they shooting it on an ear on a hand and you know pretty much don't copy it but use that as an inspiration think about the background that the um, the hand or the what's behind the head or what clothing someone's wearing, what skin tone, that sort of thing. Think about those things carefully. Um, but yeah, generally, jewelry on a person's body is much more effective than a simple product shot of it not on the body because it does a lot more to show scale and fit and how it looks when it's worn. I think because most of the most of the jewelry we sell on our platform, actually they have the lifestyle shots, and I do think that a lot of uh, makers do make a mistake that they do not put, you know, uh, the lifestyle shot. So I think that is very important, and most of the people um, are struggling with that, which is the right photo. And so, is it good to say that fifty percent of the shot should be the jewelry? So it should not be too far so that you're seeing the whole model and it should not be too close that you are seeing the skin pores, everything. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, well, it de depends on the, the size of the jewelry. Um, I mean, the, the finer the jewelry is, the closer you have to go um, to see the, the, that detail. If it's a very fine personalized necklace with a gemstone, you really have to go very close in to see that. Otherwise you're not really um, getting it across. But yeah, I mean, 50 to 80% of the frame should be filled with the product. I think with jewelry, maybe it's more like 30 to 60% um, because otherwise you're going so far in that the, there's there's too much detail to take in. So you just need to be able to see what the object is, what it's made of, the shape of it. Um, yeah, without going too close. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a balancing act. You just have to play with it. Also, it depends how the image is being cropped. It's usually going to be a square. Um, so in the case of a necklace, you don't have to see the whole necklace. You don't have to see the, the, the clasp. Usually you want to see the, the chain and what's in the middle. If it's just a plain chain, you can kind of crop quite closely into it. Um, if it's a chain with a, a, a pendant on, then you can crop quite closely into the pendant just to see that and a bit of the chain and then have another shot which shows the clasp or a chain detail or something. One of the other questions was, what is the best way to shoot a luxury handbag? Uh, one of the common mistakes I see people is they put really nice photographs only the front, but they don't shoot the inside of the bag and the back. So do you have any tips from, for that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that I answered that in the q and I just said, look at Grace Gordon, who's one of the clients I've shot. Um, so generally bags require more images than most products, um, maybe up to 10 photos. So you might have front and back and side showing the whole thing. And then you might have three or four shots of details of clasps, uh, the, the, where, the strap, how it's adjusted, the pockets, what fits into the pocket? Is, is it fit uh, the iPad or a laptop or a camera? Uh, if it's a wash bag, what goes into the wash bag? You have to make all these things very clear for someone buying it. Um, and then also, how is it held? Does it have a strap? Is it a carry handle? Does it fit on an aircraft? Does it have wheels? Does it go on the shoulder? Um, how strong is it? What's the base look like? Does it have little... Um, uh, little uh, studs in it to stop it getting wet when you put it on the floor. All these little details are important. Don't leave anything um, to chance. Don't make assumptions that people understand how something works or looks on the other angle. Just show them everything. Um, anything else that we missed? Yes, uh, so what, uh, regarding the lampshade, coming back to the lampshade, um, I think one of the questions uh, was asked that, should the lampshade be lit or not? Um, yeah, I, I did mention that, I think, yeah, earlier. Um, maybe it didn't record at the beginning. Um, yeah, if you can put a bulb into the, whether it's a hanging pendant or on a lamp base and do a shot where it's lit, by all means do that. Just keep in mind that the bulb you're gonna use might vary in brightness to what someone has at home. So you might want to recommend a certain wattage of bulb. Um, so maybe say, you know, in the photo, this bulb was used, um, for example. Some people sell the lampshade with a fitting and, and a pendant uh, flex, other people don't. Um, but usually there's a standard fitting in the lampshade frame to fit uh, the pendant or flipped around for the for the base, <clears throat> the way you photograph it when it's on and off can be different. Usually you want the, um, the exposure and the, the shutter speed to be a bit slower when it's on to capture the illumination of the bulb. You have to experiment with that. So if I'm shooting with flash and I do a shot of the, the lampshade off, I then have to adjust the camera settings to shoot it on to capture that illumination. So someone very good to look at for that is um, Tabitha B A R G H. I think she does cardboard um, lampshades, which sounds sort of weird, but oh, they're really beautiful. So Google her. I think that's how you spell her surname, and you'll see very clear on and off shots of pendant lights. Um, which are, are very inspiring and really bring it to life. Like her products look completely different when they're on and off when they have the bulb inside. But sort of standard fabric lampshades will not look that different. It depends, but it's good to show it if you can. Thanks, Jason. I will just ask if anybody has any questions they would like to ask, please raise your hand so that I can um, open the um, presentation for you. There is one raised hands, I think. Oh, no, there's nobody um, there. There was one more question was that, are there any light boxes with built-in LEDs that you would recommend for porcelain ceramics? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the brand names. I, I've never used one myself, but I think I mentioned um, there's a thing called the photography show that happens once a year where brands launch all their new products. So that's a good way to browse different brands um, Wex Photo, W-E-X, are the main photographic supplier. Um, and if you Google LED light box and look at some reviews and some demonstrations, you can find one that's the right, the right sort of spec for you. Um, but they can be a bit sort of cheap uh, feeling and obviously they're quite small. So I'd be careful. Um, you can essentially build your own light box by using tracing paper or, or this diffusion material on a bigger scale. All it basically is, is stopping ambient light and reflections influencing your product. So if you just cover something in tracing paper, like a dome or using foam boards, you kind of have the same effect as, as you do with a light box. 
Thanks. Um, thanks, Jishin. There's uh, Chris who would like to ask a question. I'm just going to, uh, he's going to ask directly. Yeah. Hi, Chris, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have just asked a question about, um, I, I photograph very fluffy fiber, spinning fiber. So color's important, but the surface is very matte and diffuse. Have you got any tips? Um, yeah, usually with fibers, they, they can reflect quite a lot. Um, depends on the, on, the, on the material, if it's wool or, um, or, or silk or it's uh, felt. Um, well, I mean, you have to experiment with different kinds of lighting on it. I mean, putting it closer or further away to a window, um, maybe taking it outside. Um, usually flash artificial lighting doesn't work so well with fibrous textiles because it creates a bit too much of intensity reflection within the fibers. So it can affect color. It can make something look a bit too um, highly detailed and, and sharp. So I'd usually use natural light, quite soft light, but a big light source, like a big window, north facing skylight, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Okay. That's probably Thank what you. I'd say. Yeah. No worries. Somebody was asking about photographing ceramics in context without using flowers. Um, yeah, just, just generally placing ceramics in a house environment on a shelf on a mantelpiece, on a table with recognizable objects around it, or perhaps having someone hold it in their hand. I mean, it's a classic shot for someone to hold a mug in their hand like that, not showing the face, but just cropping in a nice jumper behind or a t-shirt. That's a good way to show scale and sort of how large it is, how the handle works, that sort of thing. Also pouring, pouring milk into it, into a cup of tea is an effective way to do it. Um, one of the questions is which phones have best cameras? Of course, there's always a fight between, you know, the Androids and the iPhones, Apple. So which one do you think is good for cameras, for taking photographs? I've only ever used an iPhone. Um, so from personal experience, that's for me the best one. Um, I think they've always led the way with the, the camera. I mean, I think the iPhone is basically a camera with a phone attached to it. Um, and it does all the apps and so it's a computer basically but um the other manufacturers are obviously trying to catch up and you never know until you've tried it really i mean go into a go into a car phone warehouse and try some different phones out and ask to demo the cameras and try and take photos of the same thing and see how they respond um one thing that all cameras do if you're shooting in sort of jpeg mode a JPEG is a processed and compressed image format so that when you take a picture, the camera applies its own settings to create the JPEG and different cameras will take very different JPEGs. So you'll have one which is very saturated, another one which is sharper, another one which is um, brighter perhaps. If you shoot in RAW on the phone or using an app like I mentioned or on your DSLR, you end up with quite a flat image, which you can then edit in Photoshop or a raw editing software like um, Capture One or Lightroom and create your own version of the JPEG, which you then export. So that's generally the best way to do it. If you let the camera decide for you, Nikon, Canon, Sony, they each have different kind of camera profiles and you'll end up with a very different image. It's the same with phone manufacturers, Google, Samsung, and Apple have different camera profiles. Um, some phone manufacturers say they're very good at taking nighttime photos and using flash or whatever, but for product photography, I would worry less about um, what the marketing says and just try it out yourself and maybe get a different lens for the phone to achieve the macro detail or I've got a macro lens for my phone, which takes amazing close-up shots of, of surfaces and textures and jewelry. So that's actually worth looking at. One of the last questions, Jason, before we end. Um, so any tips for shooting shiny silver jewelry? Because they people always tend to get some reflection of the camera or phone on the surface. So how can that be avoided? Uh, you could try using a light box like someone's mentioned or building your own with, with tracing paper. Um, foam boards are really, really effective. So I, I often find shooting with the foam board 
Um, so if the jewelry is on the table in front of me and I've got the camera on a tripod there, having the foam board like this, so it bounces light up into the object and maybe even there's a foam board above and behind and above, bouncing back, play around with different foam boards, um, different sizes and positions to kind of limit the reflection. And if you still have a highlight that you don't like, then the final solution is to use it to edit in Photoshop or get someone else to edit it for you to take that off. Um, it's kind of getting that balance of reflection, highlight, shadow, so that you understand the material and what it is. Obviously, polishing and cleaning it very carefully is important too. Um, but you know, you don't necessarily want it too perfect and retouched because then it's not realistic. Um, just have to get that balance. But yeah, silver and chrome and reflective metal and some of the hardest things to shoot, but also the most satisfying. <laughs>